Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nira Vora. I'm one of the neurointerventional physicians at uh, Riverside uh, for the Ohio Health Comprehensive Stroke Center. And uh, it's my pleasure to discuss uh, the shape of neurointervention at uh, our center and, and new developments across the country um, as we are in the midpoint of this uh, year 2020 and some idea of what direction we're headed uh, into the next uh, few years with uh, cerebrovascular disease and neurointervention. So just to begin, uh, kind of a perspective of, of what our stroke timeline is at Riverside, we began neurointervention really in 1999, so the late 90s, when we assembled our first team of three neurointerventional radiologists. and. Uh, over that time, the, the legacy of this program has been to be involved in all cutting edge treatments and therapies uh, that includes the first FDA approved thrombectomy device in 2004. Uh, we were part of the initial stroke thrombectomy trials from 2013 to 2015 and uh, expanding the TPA windows um, uh, and thrombectomy windows out to 24 hours. And in the last two years, we've been part of the first successful neuroprotectant stroke trial and mobile stroke treatment unit that you see uh, here within the city of Columbus. So our, our history um, uh, goes back quite a bit of time. Uh, this is in comparison to other centers where their history of stroke intervention really began in 2015 when these five uh, clinical trials were presented uh, at the 2015 International Stroke Conference. These five studies from Australia, Europe, uh, uh, North America, Canada, uh, and, and Spain, all of these studies together showed one by one the power of using uh, stent triggers and uh, appropriate patient selection for, pe for patients who have large vessel stroke and the results were dramatic and they caused a new change in the way stroke is treated. So here are four of those studies right, right here on this slide. But what's important to see, there's a busy slide showing um, each study and where they were uh, centered and what, how their metrics were assigned. But, but the pertinent rows to look at are the aspects row, about a third of the way from the bottom of the page. In that, uh, in that uh, row, you'll see that the ideal patient is a patient who has a large vessel occlusion and has minimal amount of infarct on their scan before they come for their procedure. These patients have or stand the greatest likelihood of benefiting because they have the most amount of salvageable tissue. And um, also having a procedure that's done very quickly. So from the onset time to when the, when the patient uh, is intervened is a shorter time frame. These patients did tend to do uh, remarkably better. And using a superior device such as a thectomy device, our patients were able to get significant uh, uh, levels of recovery. And because of that, uh, in 2015, thrombectomy became a standard of care for patients who have a large vessel stroke. That's when most centers in our region began the promoting stroke thrombectomy. But as you know, on the original trials for this and on the cutting edge of, of, of developing this technology and this therapy, almost even a decade before these results came out. And from 2015 2017, an additional two trials were done, which expanded the window of intervention out to 24 hours. So what we've learned in the last five years is that a patient, what we've learned in the last five years is that for any patient who presents with ischemic stroke symptoms or neurologic deficits that are acute, they are considered to be a candidate for intervention, regardless of when we find them. They may be two hours out, they may be 20 hours out, but the bottom line is that it's not a time window, 
it's not a time-based treatment uh, today. It's really a physiology or an imaging-based treatment today. And so whenever we have a patient who has symptoms concerning for acute ischemic stroke, what we really encourage is that you get them to the appropriate center where they can be imaged and considered for thrombectomy because only we only decide that they're not a candidate for thrombectomy once their imaging says they're not. But otherwise, anybody should be considered for thrombectomy regardless of time. Now, what's the importance of prevention is the power of this type of treatment. So, in, you know, prior to 2015, when prior to when we had uh, Stentriever technology and before we had these clinical trials, uh, thrombectomy was still in the process of developing itself in terms of what is the ideal patient, what is the ideal process of getting a patient uh, from the field to the right center, you know, what are the time metrics that are needed, and, and, and it was very much a, um, a process that was in its infancy. But now that it's really reached, uh, you know, prime time, you can understand the power of how effective this treatment is. Um, and, and really, the main statistic to look at is the number needed to treat. So if, for example, if you had a treatment A versus a treatment B, and treatment uh, treatment A uh, uh, resulted in, or gave you better results, uh, you know, one third of the time over treatment B, then basically if you treated three patients with treatment A instead of treatment B, you improved uh, you tr you've improved one patient's chance of a good outcome uh, out of those three. And so that's referred to commonly as the number needed to treat. So how many patients do you need to treat with this new therapy to improve the outcome? And this is very important when you look at, you know, metrics in terms of what we do in the emergency medicine field, because we're all very common, uh, we, we're all very familiar with, you know, level one trauma centers versus other types of trauma centers. And, you know, why do we have level one trauma centers? Well, because when you go to a level one trauma center over a level two trauma center, uh, there is an expected level of benefit that you get by going to that level one center. So that benefit that you get for taking uh, your patients to a level one trauma center, well, you make a difference about one out of every 11 patients you send to the level one trauma center. So if you, for every 11 patients where you bypass a level two trauma center and go to a level one trauma center, you actually will improve the outcome of one patient out of 11. If you think of patients who have an acute myocardial infarction, uh, you have two treatment options. You can take the patient to a center that will offer thrombolytic therapy or take the patient to a center that will do uh, acute uh, angioplasty and stenting or PCI. And if you choose to take a patient uh, to a PCI center over a thrombolytic center, after 17 patients, you will benefit one patient from mortality. So in terms of Preventing a death for level one trauma centers, it's one out of 11. For acute PCI and myocardial infarction, it's one in 17. But as I go back to, and you look at the numbers from these stroke studies, uh, the number needed to treat, which is down at the bottom in red, the number needed to treat roughly comes out to about one in three to prevent disability. Not to prevent death, like you do with a trauma trauma one center uh, transfer or or anything from myocardial infarction. The importance of stroke intervention is that you can prevent disability uh, by taking a patient for intervention about one out of three. So this is one of the most powerful numbers needed to treat in medicine today and directly something that is impacted by your recognition in the field and your ability to get this patient to the appropriate center and knowing what to take your patients. So we've known.
ears that thrown back to me and that's kind of kind of setting things up to talk about where we're where we need to go in the next few few years so we know that thrombectomy uh, is beneficial to our patients and going back going back to this comparison slide of all the studies that I described before you have the swift prime study which is the most comparable study that that uh, matches the way we treat patients here in the United States across the board, across the country. And, and at the bottom, it says the absolute benefit or the number needed to treat is 25%. That means that this procedure over just nothing or just medical therapy, you had a 25% better chance of good outcomes. Uh, good outcomes meaning that the patient has minimal or or very mild to moderate uh, neurological deficits after 90 days. So, you know, 25% of patients who got treated with thrombectomy did better. And so roughly that translates when you look at all our patients um, across the board, across the board in the country, about 50% of the time when we treat a patient with thrombectomy, uh, half of our patients do well, meaning that they recover, they're, they're able to go home, they're able to return to work and have a meaningful life without severe disability. So that's wonderful. But now after five years, uh, what we realize is we have to do refinements or we need to take that next step uh, to improve and, and to get past that 50% glass ceiling of, of uh, uh, improving outcomes. The first step with that came this past year with the A1 study. This was a study that was reported in the Lancet and was presented at in Los Angeles at the International Stroke Meeting. Um, and it's also a, a research trial um, that was active at the uh, here at uh, Riverside Methodist Hospital with Dr. Ron Budzik, who is our uh, senior neurointerventionalist and uh, our local principal investigator for this study. So ESCAPE NA1 was a research study in which uh, a drug called naritatide was administered to the patient uh, after the procedure after they presented with a large vessel occlusion and underwent a uh, thrombectomy procedure, uh, these patients were randomized to receiving uh, norinotide or a placebo medication, and then looking to see if this medication helped in stroke recovery. So what is norinotide? Norinotide is an oxygen radical scavenger. It's a neuroprotective drug uh, that was developed uh, in an animal model and what was found with this type of, of medication is that when you infuse this medication in laboratory settings uh, this uh, this medication would block some of the excess damage that occurs within the brain after it experiences ischemia and the size of the infarct was would be smaller in in test animals and so that uh, observation led to this clinical trial. And so patients were randomized to receive thrombectomy with norinotide and th just plain thrombectomy. And we ran this trial out of Riverside along with uh, a number of other centers across the country um, and internationally for about two years. And the results came out and the overall results on this slide at, are, are seen up at the top and then there's a breakdown down at the bottom so at the top it, the goal of the study was to achieve a modified ranking score of zero to two so that so if you look at the top half of this the screen you'll see placebo versus norinotide and we're looking at really the first three rectangles there and really there was very minimal difference between patients who got uh, placebo with thrombectomy versus those patients who got norinotide with thrombectomy. But when we looked a little bit more closely at the data, 
those clients who did not get TPA, so presented maybe out, outside of the 4.5 uh, TPA time window or, or had some contraindication to TPA and still got enrolled into the study, those patients who did not get TPA but they got the norinotide with their thrombectomy procedure had a good outcome rate of 60% as opposed to about 50% who just had placebo and uh, their thrombectomy procedure. So for the first time, we're now seeing that there are additive therapies that we can do on top of just thrombectomy that improves outcome. And it was for the first time uh, that a neuroprotectant drug actually showed that there was some benefit. Uh, some of you may be back in the 1990s before we had TPA and before we had uh, thrombectomy procedures, the goal was to develop a novel neuroprotectant drug that you could give to a patient who's having a stroke and you could let them have their stroke, but the neuroprotectant drug would, would uh, keep them uh, keep the patient uh, having minimal injury injury and there were several several studies and a lot of research dollars that were spent on on this concept but unfortunately these were unanimously in, in a failure so now for the first time because we're able to get the blood vessel open and get the blood vessel open quickly when we add a neuroprotectant medication uh, there is some suggestion that we can improve stroke outcome. And so uh, uh, with this first step, uh, we're looking at participating in the next ESCAPE NA1 study to really look at patients who are not TPA candidates but require a thrombectomy and seeing if uh, we can validate these results and create a new standard of care for acute stroke therapy. Now, another lesson that we've learned from a clinical trial we were participating in is that uh, there are patients who are eligible for thrombectomy um, and have a chance at good recovery, even though typically they typically we wouldn't consider them. So as I mentioned before, a lot of the failures that we had in thrombectomy studies is that we uh, had many patients who had big infarcts going into a study. And if you have a big infarct going into a treatment, they'll have a big infarct coming out of the treatment and they really have a poor chance of good outcomes. So recently we've been involved with the University of Texas at Houston, uh, which is a major stroke center, uh, stroke research center out of the Midwest, trying to identify what the best imaging protocol is for acute stroke patients. And some of their results in what they called the SELECT trial was that patients who had a really, patients who had small strokes, so those patients who had strokes less than 50 cc's, there was a good chance that they would have a good outcome with a thrombectomy. Um, and those patients who had a really large stroke, so greater than 100 cc's, was probably about one in 10 might have a good chance of a good outcome with a thrombectomy. What we didn't expect was that that middle ground uh, group, that 50 to 100 cc uh, stroke size, uh, we, from most of the previous clinical data, suggested that these patients do not perform well uh, after they have a thrombectomy. And so largely speaking, most centers across the country and the current American Heart Association guidelines has really written off this population of patients. And it's not an insignificant number of people. There are patients who will have uh, thrombectomy, or I'm sorry, patients who will have large vessel occlusions. Uh, they'll have severe neurological deficits. They may be found late. Maybe they take a nap and when they wake up, they have deficits. And in the EMS field, you probably encounter many of these patients who uh, were called right away upon recognition, but unfortunately there was some delay and their stroke is actually of moderate to severe size. And unfortunately those patients do not get uh, any type of reperfusion treatment. So 
there's some data to suggest that maybe uh, almost a third of these patients can recover. And so we are now going to be participating in the SELECT-2 uh, study looking at this population, that population of patients who present with a moderate to severe size stroke of 50 to 100 cc's, and we look to see if they would be candidates for thrombectomy versus uh, no therapy or medical therapy and see if exactly what is the true natural history for this population. If we find that, that patients do benefit from treatment with thrombectomy, even in the moderate to severe stroke size, then that opens the window for a significant number of patients that up until now really don't have any chance of a good outcome uh, unless they get uh, treatment. So we're very excited to participate in this new study and to expand the window or expand, not the window, but the uh, opportunity or the, the, the out, outreach for thrombectomy in these patients. And in terms of expanding windows and pushing the envelope, Riverside Methodist and, and actually the entire Ohio Health Cerebrovascular System has adopted MR-guided thrombolysis in the last few months since the onset of, of our pandemic. But we've expanded our windows for IVTPA using MRI guidance. So in 2018, there were studies out done from Europe and Australia that showed you can use MRI and other imaging techniques to find patients who uh, would otherwise be would otherwise not be considered for TPA because they just presented too late. So if you use MRI, there are certain sequences within within MRI, and if you look at the right side of your screen. On the right side, you'll see where it says DWI, that's diffusion weighted image, and that is the acute image for, uh, for uh, an MRI that shows that a stroke is present. And right next to that DWI image is an image called the flare, which is another type of MRI sequence which shows the maturity or evolution of that injury on the DWI. And there are many patients who present initially outside of 4.5 hours uh, for TPA who may have changes on DWI, but that stroke hasn't evolved and completed or completely matured on the flare MRI image. And these patients actually can have reversibility of their stroke. And so it is possible that if they have a small occlusion, that these patients can still receive IV TPA with very minimal risk of hemorrhage but a real benefit. So this study that you see to the left of your screen, the, the, uh, which was defined as the wake up trial in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that by using this technique, you could actually uh, select out patients and you had about a 10% difference of, of uh, improving clinical outcome by giving TPA beyond 4.5 hours when you have a protocol for an urgent MRI. And right now, this procedure or this technique is now available at Riverside Methodist Hospital and Grant, Me and Grant Medical Center. Uh, in the last two months, two and a half months, we have treated four patients with IV TPA using this technique. And we've had patients who would otherwise be forced to go to skilled nursing or inpatient rehab actually make a very good outcome and get home. So there is, so we're seeing the benefit here and we believe in it uh, to the extent that we are, have expanded this protocol to also be available, available at all our primary stroke centers, including Mansfield Community Hospital, Marion General Hospital as well as well as Doctors West Hospital. Now we've talked a little, uh, quite a bit about ischemic stroke and what has, uh, what have been uh, are the new developments uh, this past year. 
But what about in hemorrhagic disease and in particular intracranial aneurysms? So intracranial aneurysms cause subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, which can be devastating, can, be, uh, can result in one third of patients having mortality even before they reach the hospital. But subarachnoid hemorrhage and intracranial aneurysms are present in about one in every thousand patients. These rupture one in every 10,000 times. So there, if you look at the whole population, there's quite a bit of people who have intracranial aneurysms per year. And traditionally, uh, really over the last 100 years, there's been the traditional surgical approach, which is aneurysm clipping that you see on your uh, left side of the screen there. And then there have been endovascular techniques, which are now about 20 to 25 years old. This is a picture or an example of coiling where a catheter is placed within that aneurysm and then little strings of platinum wire are released in the aneurysm to force it to clot off. But over the last 10 years, and even more recently, there, there have been new types of technology that avoid some of the pitfalls that you see with uh, clipping and or the coiling procedure I described above. So you have flow diversion embolization in which a woven stent can be placed outside the aneurysm itself. And once the stent is placed outside the aneurysm, this technique sort of uh, diverts flow away from the aneurysm and allows the endothelial wall to regrow and remodel and the aneurysm itself clots off and shrinks. A newer, and here's an example of how that works. You can see in your top left screen uh, an example of an aneurysm uh, uh, in the superior hypophyseal uh, segment of the internal carotid artery. It's noted by that red arrow. Uh, when the patient presented for their treatment, you can see in the top right side of the screen that there is kind of a new structure within the shape of that carotid artery that is the stent, the pipeline flow diverting stent, which is placed across where that aneurysm was. And after six months, you can see that in the same image and at that same spot where the aneurysm used to be, the blood vessel wall has regrown into that aneurysm site and sealed the aneurysm off completely. That is no longer um, uh, a problem for this particular patient. So this is really amazing technique and technology that's really developed over the last 10 years. Now that's outside the aneurysm, but now there are newer treatments that we use for inside the aneurysm. So as opposed to coiling, coiling is a procedure where we, as I mentioned before, you introduce numerous strands of platinum wire inside the aneurysm itself. With each strand that you enter, there's always a risk that you can knock the previous stand, strand loose. You can form clot uh, around the interface of the aneurysm and the, the uh, main blood vessel. Uh, there's always a risk that as you're introducing the wire, there can be a perforation of the, uh, of the aneurysm itself. Plus, with treatment of an intersacular aneurysm with coils, uh, there are certain configurations of the aneurysm that uh, are not safe for coiling. So a wide aneurysm, for example, there's a high chance that the coils can slip out of the aneurysm. So that's led to the development of intrasacular treatment. And this is a treatment where you can uh, administer uh, one woven device that will help seal the aneurysm at the neck and allow the blood vessel wall to re-endothelialize and seal itself off, but it's with one, uh, it's with the introduction of one device. So the first example of this is the woven endobridge or the web device made by Microvention. Uh, this is a trial that has, or this is a device that has undergone numerous study in Europe, but was really adopted uh, after it received FDA approval in the United States. F FDA approval in the United States was done after a trial uh, 
uh, of 150 patients with wide aneurysms and our neurointerventional site was the only site in Ohio involved with this clinical trial. And as you can see on that diagram to the right, a catheter is positioned halfway into the aneurysm and then this basket is released inside the aneurysm itself. And I'll show you an example. This is a basilar artery apex aneurysm that you see um, in the top left uh, corner. And then you can watch the, as you go clockwise with our procedure uh, or clockwise around the, the slides in the top right, you'll see that the catheter is positioned right at the base of that aneurysm. If you go to the bottom left, now the web device is released through that catheter. It starts to unfold and blossom out. And then just moments later, this device unfolds itself and actually conforms to the entire geometry of the aneurysm. You see that in the top left. Um, and then on the bottom of the screen at 24 hours, when we do a follow-up angiogram, there's no dye filling into that aneurysm. And we've been treating uh, roughly uh, four to five aneurysms uh, a month with this technique here in uh, 2020. And we have found that this is a very rapid technique. If you compare to the original treatment of aneurysms with surgical clipping, these are procedures that even today, after 100 years of refinements, still takes about six to eight hours to do. A coiling procedure after uh, 25 years of development still is about a two hour procedure. And if the anatomy is right for uh, a web treatment like this, like you see above, these procedures can be completed within 10 to 15 minutes. So we're reducing radiation exposure to the patient as well as risk uh, during uh, the intraoperative phase. Another example of a ruptured aneurysm, which was treated during our recent COVID pandemic. This is an eight millimeter middle cerebral artery aneurysm in an elderly patient. Typically, middle cerebral artery aneurysms have always been treated with surgery. Uh, but in this particular scenario, with a patient having had a rupture, with the patient uh, also being elderly, they were not deemed to be a safe candidate for surgical therapy. And this is where the web treatment really comes to benefit uh, because with coiling, if we had tried to coil this aneurysm, you'll notice that there's a small branch coming out of the base of that aneurysm. And with coiling, it's unpredictable if this branch can be preserved. But with precise placement of this web device, you can measure out and select the appropriate size of device and know that that branch can be preserved at the end of the procedure. So in summary, uh, our program for neurointervention uh, did not begin in 2015. We've gone through many uh, technology innovations and iterations with stroke intervention and cerebrovascular disease, and we've been there for each step of the new evolution of this field. And a lot of that is because of the partnership we've had with EMS and our community uh, you've had, you've cooperated and helped us get the data for this first comprehensive stroke center to be part of the clinical trials that have impacted patients across the country. So we're going to continue to push for better outcomes in our stroke patients. Uh, we're going, uh, we are going to be launching our trial for large strokes, uh, but also for neuroprotection. And we look forward to your cooperation as we move from 2020 and into 2021 with a goal to improve uh, stroke outcome uh, and give the best, uh, uh, the best cutting edge treatment for our community. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you today. And look forward to, for, for, look forward to further collaborations. Thank you.